This is CBC Here and Now. Here and Now is live at Ken Mount Terrace tonight, where fire has been threatening the neighborhood today. Water bombers tackle the fire from the air. Firefighters fought flames on the ground, trying to prevent it from spreading to homes. All residents, you need to access your vehicle and leave the area immediately. And police went door to door, getting people out of the area. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. Ariana Kelland is my co-host this evening, and she's live at Kenmount Terrace, stick handling our coverage of the fire. Ariana? Well, thanks, Debbie. What a complete juxtaposition between the pictures you just saw there and what the scene is like here in Kim Out Terrace tonight. People have their sprinklers on, they're walking their dogs, but it was a totally different scene several hours ago. The evacuation order here on Orlando Place and three other streets in Kim Out Terrace were only lifted within the last hour. People are slowly making their way back into their homes to see what damage has been done because we do know that some homes have sustained damage. And just to get a sense of how close this fire came. If you look behind me, you'll see some blackened trees behind a home there. That's only about 25 meters away. So it came dangerously close, but it was a much more chaotic scene earlier today. Katie Breen was at the scene shortly before two o'clock. So Katie, uh, set the scene for us. What did it look like here? Well, people were panicked. I arrived shortly after two o'clock when people were being told that they needed to leave. And what I saw was a street lined with open trunks. Homeowners were shuttling their belongings from their homes into their vehicles, you know, clothes, food, their pets, because, you know, they didn't know when they were going to be able to come back, when or what condition their house would be in when they arrived. Now, for people who weren't uh, who didn't have a vehicle. There was a Metro bus, bus service available. It was driving through the neighborhood for people on foot, getting them to safety. And the police were also here um, going door to door, making sure that everyone was getting out. People with mobility issues, they were ensuring that they had transportation if they didn't have if they couldn't drive or if they couldn't walk to that shuttle. Now, here's what one evacuee had to say. I'm actually really nervous. I said goodbye to my sweet house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's really bad because all these people, there was actually someone next door who has a dog and doesn't have anywhere to go. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Now the threat of course is big here because this is a suburban area of St. John's. The houses are close together and they're really not that far away from the fire as you could see. Uh, the conditions today, of course, not ideal for a forest fire. It's dry, it's windy, it's warm. The fire was pushing through at points, really growing. It reached at least a half a kilometer in length. And here's what the fire chief had to say. The fire started behind Orlando up here and jumped pretty fast in these high wind conditions. Uh, so it left Orlando and went straight down to Duke. So we're uh, playing catch up uh, since we got here. The good news is, of course, the fire is under control. The evacuation has been lifted. People are returning home, of course, thankful that this wasn't worse. Thanks, Katie. Very thankful indeed, but the fire department is saying tonight that it's not completely over. Uh, just a short while ago, we saw a water bomber overhead trying to douse some of those hot spots. And I'm on Orlando Place right now, but there are three other streets in Kim Out Terrace also affected by this tonight. That's where Ryan Cook is. Ryan. Well, Ariane, I'm joined here with uh, local resident Gary Cranford. And Gary, can you just kind of paint the picture for me? What was this scene like when, when you were told to evacuate? Oh, it was dramatic. Uh, started it all, we were, we were just in the house, just here behind. And uh, we were just relaxing and doing a normal day. And uh, Luann called out to me. She said, there's a lot of smoke. She said, there's smoke coming from somewhere behind us. And within... It was, it was within no period of time. I mean, we had the windows open. Uh, the wind is so strong that it was, just taking, it was just taking the smoke right into the house. You couldn't, like all these houses from my house, you couldn't see them. It was just, all you could, all you could was flame or the, the smoke and the ashes the, from the flame. And then the firefighters actually came into your house, uh, didn't we, they? We stayed. Uh, Luann had, we had three kids there with us. Um, 
we stayed and uh, I went around and when I realised what was on the go, I went around and I closed all the windows and turned off the, the Venmar. Mm -hmm. And uh, we stayed and we didn't know what to be doing. And then the fire department came shortly after and uh, the guy, guy with his shorts on just ran in the house and he said, he showed him, flicked his badge because my grandson was crying and he flicked his, he flicked his badge open. And he said, don't worry, he said, I'm with the fire department. He said, you're going to be all right. So yeah. that was all right. We just, he said, you got you got to go and you got to go now. So we just picked, we, we picked kids up, no car, no car seats, just picked kids up, put them in the car. And we went down on the end of the road. And when I turned, I looked back and it was like just black. And even when we were coming out of the house to get into the car, it was just, the smoke was so thick that you, you could feel it just, and you, yeah. And the flankers were just hitting your body. Yeah. And I said, I said, there's not going to be nothing left. It was just like Fort, I wasn't in Fort Mac, but yeah. I mean, I can imagine what it was like because I mean, it was just like a, a picture from Fort Mac with yeah. fire trucks going and hoses coming out. And, yeah. and I figured when I looked, I saw the smoke from all the back of these houses. I figured it wouldn't going to be nothing left. I said, it's going to be finished, right? Well, thank you very much for that, Gary. Okay. I can see you're obviously visibly yeah. emotional. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, as he mentioned there, the, the Fort Mac reference, I was speaking with a police officer here just a few minutes ago who said if the wind had not turned around when it did, this would have been another Fort McMurray. Ariana? Yeah, Ryan, as you can tell by what's happening in my hair right now, it is incredibly windy still up here in Kemount Terrace, and that's why we're still hearing the fire bomber circling, the water bomber rather, circling around top. Firefighters are still remaining near the scene, and residents are being asked to kind of water down their mulch, water down their gardens. And we do know that at least 11 homes were damaged by today's fire. Uh, no homes destroyed and no major uh, damage to report, but siding definitely melted off some homes. Some decks caught on fire and I'm going to bring in our reporter Stephen Miller right now because Stephen was actually on a different story today. He was at the Avalon Mall just a short distance away, but you saw the smoke. You smell the smoke. Um, so you came here pretty quickly after the fire started. Uh, what did you see when you were here? Well, when we arrived on the scene, the evacuation order hadn't exactly been given for this area. So uh, the smoke was so thick that you couldn't see more than probably a foot in front of your face. Uh, once the evacuation order was given, there was a fair amount of panic. People were, uh, you know, getting in their cars, loading up, taking off as quickly as possible. Um, the flames themselves, once I got to look behind the actual uh, houses, they were probably within a few meters of actually touching the houses themselves. Uh, I heard some people say that they had stuff in the backyard, like uh, playground a plastic kiddie pool, all of those had melted. Uh, there was also a deck, as you mentioned, that caught on fire, and I actually uh, saw some firefighters hosing off the siding and the deck itself to make sure that it didn't spread. Yeah, incredible, incredible story, and it could have ended much worse. And, of course, firefighters were up against the lot. They had to uh, fight this fire in pretty extreme heat. The winds are still very, very, very strong. We're going to hear from the fire department a little later in the show. Debbie? Thank you so much, Ariana, and we will check in with you, as you say, later in the show. Well, forestry officials are warning there are some ideal conditions for forest fires, hot and windy weather. Now, this is the current fire hazard map. It shows extreme for central Newfoundland. Several other areas on the island are listed as high or very high. However, the West Coast and most of Labrador are seeing levels in the low to moderate range. Now, this map is a new tool used by forestry officials and will be updated regularly. Meanwhile, fire crews are keeping an eye on two forest fires that have been burning this weekend. A crew was above Kappa Hayden on the southern shore today looking for hot spots. Water bombers were over the area this weekend trying to douse the flames. Fire officials say about 15 hectares had burned. And crews were back at Greats Cove today to check on things after a fire broke out there late Friday afternoon. Many people were forced out of the community when that fire started, but have since been able to return. Well, Carolyn, oh, those winds, they wow. are something. They were fanning the flames at Kenmount Terrace. 
they were pretty strong. They were, yeah. I just checked and uh, they got up to about 75 kilometers an hour this afternoon, southwesterly wind. So that's expected to stay pretty strong tomorrow. And things are going to be really dry tomorrow and hot. That is the big story for the island tomorrow. First, let's have a look at uh, the highs today. And you can see that Badger was the hot spot. Uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, 28 degrees as the high there today. So some really hot temperatures on the island for sure. And we do have the severe thunderstorm watch in effect, and that's for the Labrador City, Wabush, Churchill Falls area. That's for tonight. And uh, you're looking at high winds, uh, the, the thunder and lightning, and uh, also this tor torrential rainfall fall that could happen. Excuse me. <clears throat> Losing my voice there and you can see the action that's happening uh, right there in Lab West overnight tonight. Things clearing off nicely on uh, the island tomorrow, but things are going to be very, very hot, especially if you're in the central area. There is a heat warning in effect for the Deer Lake area over to Buckins, Gander, Grand Falls, Windsor. It's going to get up to about 30 degrees there tomorrow with the Humidex around 32. We also have a fog advisory for the Southern Avalon, so it's going to be very dense fog there tomorrow. More. I'll get into more details a bit later. Debbie? Thanks, Carolyn. A three-year-old boy has died in Natwashish. RCMP received a call from the community clinic around 6 p.m. on Saturday reporting a child suffering from serious injuries. By the time police arrived, the boy had been declared dead. The cause of the death has yet to be determined, but police seized a vehicle and conducted multiple interviews. The town of Happy Valley Goose Bay is marking pride in a big way this year. This is one of at least six crosswalks around town painted to mark the occasion. They kicked off events today with the flag raising at Town Hall. We'll see what they have in store for this week coming up on Here and Now. Community leaders on the Northern Peninsula are concerned about the public safety. Police services in the region changed two months ago. On-call officers are now being called in from neighboring communities instead of their own detachments. CBC Investigates has learned the RCMP had concerns about sharing services that date back years. Here now's Colleen Connors has that story. The Great Northern Peninsula. Stunning, but vast. The twisting, turning highway is long empty and the beautiful coastal communities are spread out and so are the police. The RCMP are now sharing services between detachments. That has regional mayors concerned about the public safety and the safety of police officers who are traveling the roads. Since May, on-call services are now provided by nearby detachments. That means St. Anthony is working with Roddickton Bide Arm and Port Saunders is sharing with Flowers Cove, 100 kilometers apart. If they've got to come a couple of hours from Roddington to back somebody up, that's a long trip, especially with our inclement weather, weather and our bad roads. St. Lanier Gricket is tucked away from St. Anthony on the twisting road to Lansa Meadows. Colburn says she rarely sees a police car. We used to see them on a daily basis. I can't remember the last time I saw one now, but I'm sure they're around somewhere. We have a wonderful staff in St. Anthony. I just wish they were better utilized. The RCMP told CBC News that officers are sharing services for two reasons, money and the well-being of its members. The RCMP, of course, is responsible to effectively uh, manage uh, public funds, but we're also thinking about our officers. Our officers have undergone considerable amount of on-call time. They're either working or they're on call, and these small detachments have uh, very few resources. So sharing that on-call between uh, the few members that are in each detachment uh, is just unsustainable. Cook promised no change in the numbers of duty officers in these smaller detachments. He says the sharing of services is possible because of the low crime rate and the low volume of calls during quiet hours. But emergencies still happen. If there's a domestic or a vehicle accident or a fire, they've got to come for two hours and that's not going to help us. That when things go wrong, how long are we going to have to wait on this side of the Northern Peninsula for someone to come to respond to an emergency service? 
the police say there are plans in place to tackle those long response times. Each officer has the ability to risk manage and determine what resources they need to respond and the time frame in which they need to respond. So this doesn't preclude them from being able to call out resources from the detachment that's closer. It's just that they alternate the on-call uh, time between them. Changes to police service on these roads is nothing new to the RCMP. Documents obtained through access to information show that four years ago, there were concerns about response times and the danger of sharing on-call services. This is a consistent concern expressed by many members when hubbing between detachments occurs, especially when the backup is in excess of 30 minutes and could be up to as much as an hour or more. Why wait for something to go wrong and then say, in retrospect, we shouldn't have done that? I would like to see that services were maintained the way that they were. Will the RCMP reverse this hubbing effect on the Northern Peninsula? Probably not, but they will assess the program, speak to all the mayors in this area, and have another look and see if it's working come the fall of the year. Colleen Connors, CBC News, just outside St. Anthony. A George Street bar has been forced to temporarily close after losing its liquor license again. A notice in the window says it was suspended by the NLC until next week. Meanwhile, the bar says it's closed due to unforeseen circumstances. Last year, the facility was shut down for six weeks after it was found responsible for 17 infractions under the Liquor Control Act. Construction work on a dangerous intersection in St. John's was scheduled to begin today. Polina Road, across from the Avalon Mall, has been the site of numerous accidents, including the death of motorcyclist Nicholas Coates. Coates was killed by a drunk driver who tried to make a left-hand turn onto Kenmount Road on August 16. Uh, 16th rather in 2013. His family has lobbied for years to get the road realigned with the Avalon Mall exit. Symbolizes a new beginning. Um, hopefully once these changes are made then this intersection will be safer and no one else will have to bury their loved one due to some sort of road crash. For us it was impaired driving and it's channeled a lot of changes in this province. We've been very fortunate that we've got a government that's willing to listen and make changes. So for us, this just is kind of symbolic. Hundreds flooded to the south coast of the island this weekend for Con River's 23rd annual powwow. The three-day event is organized by the Miawi Bugek First Nation. Mi'kmaq from all over Canada and the U.S. were there to share an indigenous culture and traditions, including one traditional dancer who was there to celebrate her lifelong commitment to sobriety. Coming out as a dancer is... is committing to the community that I'm going to dance for them and I'm going to pray for them and I'm going to be the best role model I can be. Being part of the power is, we use a term called the power of family. And that is, um, as you see, Denise here, Tammy, and uh, everybody, all the dancers, everybody in the committee, that we are family. And we meet up every year and we celebrate our indigenousness together. It is Pride Week in Happy Valley Goose Bay and there's lots in store to mark the occasion. Organizers are happy to see the event back in full swing after last year's events were scaled back. They kicked off the week's events this afternoon with a pride flag raising ceremony at Town Hall. And that's where Here and Now's Jacob Barker is. So Jacob, how are things shaping up for this year? Well, Debbie, there is a lot of excitement that there's a full slate of activities for Pride again this year. Last year, they, there were some events to mark the occasion, but it was scaled back because of the availability of some of the key organizers. I'm very glad that we're going to have the full week of Pride events. Last year, we did have the March and Pride in the Park, but it's good to have our second week of events. We hope it'll become an annual thing. Today, the pride flag was raised together with the Labrador flag to kick things off. A sign of inclusiveness and acceptance, a safe space for the LGBTQQS community. I usually start coming out to people last year and made me more stronger about who I am. What is the most difficult part of coming out in a, in a, in a town like Goose Bay? Uh, um, telling people, um, 
telling people that clo that's close to you and you don't know how they'll react about us be coming out at a young age. Does having events like this and knowing that there's supports there for you, does that make it easier? Yes, it's, I'm, I'm just so happy to be here today. For some, the week is a celebration of Canada's inclusiveness. Misha Savolap says it's a lot different where she's from in Eastern Europe. Seeing the flag fly for her means a lot. Yes, it makes my heart feel very open and like it's uh, safe to love. And the main message of Safe Alliance is that love is love. And uh, we often do need to feel safe in order to expand. The town is taking strides to show its inclusiveness with the rising of the flag, as well as at least six crosswalks around town with a hint of pride in them. But some here say there is always more that can be done. We need to remember though that every time there's a hateful conversation that's happening, there's usually somebody who has to hear it who's remaining quiet, who's remaining unsafe, who feels awful because the people they love don't understand them. So I think, you know, more crosswalks, that's, that's a step of the education that's got to come with every crosswalk that's painted. Well, Debbie, there's a number of public events that are taking place throughout the week. Starting tomorrow night, there's going to be a boil up on the beach through to next weekend where we're going to see a march and Pride in the Park just across the street from here. Reporting live for here and now in Happy Valley Goose Bay, I'm Jacob Barker. Thanks so very much, Jacob. The Provincial Craft Council leaves their historic home at Devon House for a new, bigger space down the road. A showcase for modern and traditional crafts coming up right after the break.
Welcome back to Here and Now. One of St. John's oldest buildings is saying goodbye to its latest tenant. The Craft Council of Newfoundland and Labrador called historic Devon House home for nearly three decades. But it doesn't mean the council is saying goodbye to its roots. Here now's Malone Mullen has more. Files, dust and lost crafts, all dug up over the past month at Devon House. There are treasures in here, but many of them aren't getting the space they deserve. Devon House, built in the mid-19th century, survived the Great Fire of 1892. It's tucked away at the base of Signal Hill, near the old Newfoundland Hotel. For the last 27 years, the Craft Council has showcased its traditional goods in this fittingly historic place. But my favorite details are in these door frames that are right behind us. Um, just the, the solidity and the craftsmanship of this solid wood framing, it's like you really feel the level of care of the craftsperson when you're standing in a historic building like this. As the council says goodbye to their old home, it's not all despair. Their new space is just down the road, along Duckworth Street, even closer to downtown. It's got bigger, brighter rooms, more floor space, and unlike Devon House, it's accessible to people with mobility issues. It also has an expanded shop so local crafters can hawk their wares and even keep up with surging interest. You, you had to have knitting because if not you didn't have any mitts or you didn't have any hats or socks or even your underwear. I mean, you, you know, you, you had to have it knit because if not you didn't have it. You couldn't run off to the Walmarts or Sears or unless you ordered from the catalogue <laughs> uh, to get that kind of stuff. So knitting was uh, a tradition that's been carried on and has sort of had a real revival in the last little while. And is hand carved. It can also showcase more of the council's permanent collection, imprisoned for years in those dusty boxes in the overflowing Devon House. As the council says goodbye to their old home, it's not all despair. Craft is evolving and we often hear about contemporary craft, but all of that came from from a root that all came from like a traditional technique. They come from a place uh, and it's a place of uh, labor and love that all craft, pe craft pieces are, are made from. The new gallery might be shiny and modern, but the Craft Council doesn't think the upgrade will upstage the traditional art forms on display inside. Malone Mullen, CBC News, St. John's. They can be quirky, personal, often corny. And as of next month, this province will be the last place in Canada without them. Vanity license plates. That got here and now's David Gonzalez wondering, is it time for Newfoundland and Labrador to follow the pack and start personalizing their plates? And if you had a personalized car plate, uh, what would you have? Hmm. Well, a true Newfoundlander, so perhaps a picture of uh, a landscape of an ocean, maybe. <laughs> Something like that. Um, probably dice or something. Something funny, I don't know. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, something probably inspirational, something to do with, like, family or something like that. Proud to be a Newfie. <laughs> Proud to be a Newfie, but I would maybe endorse... Uh, Newfoundland Labrador Soccer, which would be in LSA. Hundreds turned out for the Con River Pow Wow this weekend, and we'll take you back there next.
to you by Take Charge Business Efficiency Program. Over 570 businesses have saved energy and taken charge of their bottom line. Find out how you can, too. Welcome back, everyone. Carolyn, it was a beautiful day for many of us. Gorgeous sunshine. Uh, we'll forget about the fires and the winds for this moment. Yeah. But uh, we have some beautiful video to show yes. everybody. Let's have a look. So this video, isn't that amazing? It has it all. Yes, was taken by Una Ryan Davis Friday evening at Fishing Point in St. Anthony. That's the entrance to St. Anthony Harbor. Una says the whale, uh, the whales were all along the shoreline for about half a kilometer. Oh, and look at the iceberg in the background. Just gorgeous. Oh, what a great video. People are so lucky to be able to see that. Guess many, many, many whales. Yeah. So now this video was sent to us by Kelly Lynn. She posted this on her CBCNL Facebook page. Thank it, you very much. It was taken at uh, St. Vincent's on the southern Avalon Peninsula on Sunday. Oh, just fabulous. Lots of whales on the go. And so many beautiful photos being sent in to us as well, uh, particularly with the weekend that we had. It was so nice. And I just wanted to start by showing oh. you this one. Port Rexton, Tom Egan, thank you so much for sending uh, that in. Just gorgeous. And I'm sneaking in one of my own that I took on the weekend because <laughs> I spent the whole weekend in the garden and uh, chasing butterflies and bees and taking pictures. So I just thought this was a pretty one that I'd like to share. I'm glad you did. I, <laughs> I think you weren't going to, but I think it was a wise choice to let us see. It's very pretty. Gorgeous, yes. All right, well, let's get to the weather forecast because there is a lot to talk about. I must say, uh, starting with tonight, we do have uh, some showers and thunder showers in Labrador. That's where most of the action is uh, this evening. Uh, showers moving across uh, Labrador. Things clear tomorrow on the island, but we do have this severe thunderstorm storm watch in place for Labrador City, Wabush and the Churchill Falls area. So it's going to be uh, really high winds and that chance of thunder showers. So pretty much across Labrador, there's a risk of thunder showers, but things are expected to be the most severe in the West, particularly with the winds gusts up to 80 there. So that's going to be the big thing in Labrador West tonight on the island. Fairly quiet winds are staying fairly strong southwest 40 gusting to 60 overnight tonight and we do have this heat warning in effect for most of central uh, parts of the island as well as the north coast there so things are going to get really hot 30 degrees uh, we're looking at temperatures tomorrow with a higher humidex and we do have this fog advisory in place for the southern Avalon so if you are going to be driving in that area if you're from out of town you may not be used to that level of fog it's going to be pretty dense for sure. So tomorrow, let's have a look at these temperatures. We're starting off the day uh, in the central area, about 17 degrees in Badger, but you can see throughout the day how those temperatures are going to start to bump up by the time we get around uh, noontime, one o'clock. We're at 28 degrees here in central areas, and th those showers will be persisting throughout tomorrow in Labrador as well as that risk of thunder showers. So it's going to be very active in Labrador tomorrow. You can see the highs in central 30 degrees, but not too shabby here in the east either, getting up to 24 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud tomorrow, 28 uh, in Bonavista. Going to stay cooler along the southern Avalon where all of that fog is going to be coming in. Some drizzly weather there as well. Corner Brook looking at 28 degrees. Much cooler in Labrador, but you can see this risk of thunder showers will continue throughout the day tomorrow. So as we get into Wednesday, uh, we have some showers moving through the east as well as through Labrador. I'll get into that a bit later and we'll talk a little bit about that tropical storm, Chris, that's heading our way later this week. Well, several hundreds of people poured into Khan River this weekend for three days of celebrations. Miawi Bugek First Nation hosted its 23rd annual powwow on the island's south coast. People from all over the province and the continent gathered to dance, drum, and honor the Mi'kmaq culture. Here's our grand entry Uh, anytime we come to Palo Alto is a great time. You can feel the spirit, you can feel the energy right now. If you look behind us, you see people ready for the grand entry. And fabulous, we gave our veterans here, our military, our police, 
and a lot of other people here getting ready for grand entry. So any time that we can come here as Halibu or come here as part of our overall Newfoundland Mi'kmaq community, it's a great day for us all. So I'm, I'm really pleased and honored to be here. Today I came out as a woman's traditional dancer to show that we can dance, celebrate who we are without drugs and alcohol. It's, going to, it's a lifelong commitment to sobriety. Pow Wow is, a, is an opportunity to meet old friends, uh, make new friends, and it's a chance to, to uh, sort of reinforce our traditions, traditions that uh, previous generations, as I said, just haven't had a chance to uh, to partake in any of that, uh, you know, you go back uh, one or two generations, there was a lot of uh, discrimination, a lot of racism, uh, and, and now it's, uh, you know, I think Indigenous people uh, are finally uh, um, sort of uh, trying to, uh, I guess, really recognize what happened, and, and also, I mean, a lot of people do this uh, to honor our ancestors, uh, and again, it's, uh, it's a way of uh, keeping those traditions alive and trying to instill those traditions in, uh, in younger people. Stay with us, we'll take you back live to Ken Mount Terrace to get the latest on today's fire and what residents in the area need to know as they head back to their homes. to evacuate our homes and before that we were engulfed in smoke we couldn't even see outside of our home it was all white it was really crazy all residents you need to access your vehicle and leave the area immediately we come get our dogs and they kind of like personal belongings i just came back from vacation so whatever wasn't unpacked in the dogs <laughs> just you know life documents uh change of clothes guys we need to get ahead of the division i know you want to get your shot there but we got to get out of here Now, I'm Arianna Kellen live in Chem Mount Terrace tonight where residents are slowly making their way back to their homes hours after fire 
threaten to destroy this neighborhood in St. John's. Now, if you are one of the residents in this area, one of the four streets that were ordered to evacuate earlier today, here are some things that you need to know. Newfoundland Power did shut off electricity a little earlier today, so the fire department says that you may not get your power back right away. The fire department is also asking that you turn on your sprinklers, that you hose down the mulch because there may still be some hot spots around. You may be able to hear the water bomber is still circling overhead and making sure that the fire is actually out because we have some pretty high winds up here in Camount Terrace today and that's not conducive for fighting a forest fire. But we're going to go live right now to Ryan Cook who is also in Camount Terrace tonight. Ryan? Well, Ariana, this charred deck that you're looking at right here kind of symbolizes how close this actually came to being a full-fledged disaster. The fire chief says that if this deck had have spread to the house, these other houses could have gone up. Now, I'm standing here with Ken Da. Ken, your daughter, owns this property, I understand. Can you just kind of explain to us what, what happened earlier, how close this came? Well, I was over here sometime between noon and one, uh, cat sitting. I drop by each day during the week just to take care of the cats, give them some food and water and that. Uh, my daughter and her guy John had been away during the week and are returning tonight. So when I came out of the house, I smelled some smoke and saw some ash. So I hopped in the car and went down Stefano to Great Eastern and over, and I could see the woods on fire. And I said, uh oh, this is trouble. So I drove back immediately to get the cats, get the cats out of the house, and the uh, police were on the street by that time. Uh, but uh, trying to get the cats, I looked out through the patio door and the patio deck was on fire and flames were coming up pretty high on the on this front part of the deck and uh, said to shout out to a policeman there in the doorway the deck is on fire he got on the radio with firemen but as it happened our backyard neighbors uh, saw the fire there was a fire truck out on that street and they immediately came over and knocked down the fence and uh, got the hose on the fire I got to say, give it another two or three minutes without anyone noticing. Yeah. Side the house would have been off, the house would have been on fire, and there would have been flames shooting off in this whole neighborhood, all these houses. It would have been a disaster. Yeah. So I really lucked out that uh, saw the fire, the neighbors saw it, and the firemen happened to be right there and knocked it down right away, thank God. And thank you to the firemen and police who were around. They did a great job. Now this fire is one of, we're told, seven or eight fires that started because of mulch. You can see the mulch down here in front of us. So again, firefighters are stressing to people, water down your mulch tonight. Ariana. Thank you, Ryan. Well, I spoke with the acting deputy platoon chief a little earlier today when this evacuation order was lifted, and he said that there certainly were challenges for firefighters, the heat, the wind being two factors. Here's what Scott Tilly had to say quite a few hot spots around. There's a siding is burnt off of 11 houses. Uh, the patios are gone in some of the houses. Uh, so we just like to, you know, to come back and water your flower boxes. The, all the mulch around your house is pretty dry and just keep an eye on it. The, the power will be gone for some of these areas because the transformers or some of the telephone poles and communication lines are all burned off. Uh, so we'd like for people to get back now and they can, you know, check their deep fridges and uh, you know, fish tanks or whatever, because the power might be gone to this area for some time, uh, waiting for the fire to be extinguished, and then uh, power crews and communication, the cable crews, come in and replace their uh, lines. So, uh, yeah, we just uh, like to lift the order now. We're going to, I just spoke to the RNC, they're going to tweet it out, and we're going to retweet it, and with the help of some of the news people, maybe we can uh, get some of the people back in their houses and, uh, and keep an eye on some of this, because there's uh, still quite a few hot spots around. Okay, so even uh, when the people do come back, um, I assume that the water bombers and you guys will still be in the area because there are some hot spots. Right, we're going to work up until dark. Uh, uh, and if people got any questions at all or any concerns, that they see anything they don't like, to call 911 and we'll dispatch another crew to, uh, to uh, address their concerns. Uh, still very early days, but uh, any idea about the cause? Uh, no, at this particular time, uh, the RNC and forestry will... Uh, uh, you know, launch an investigation, try to determine, in fact, the cause of this fire. But it's pretty fast moving. The winds again today are pretty high. So uh, it's quite a challenge. 
and the winds are still high here in Camount Terrace, as Carolyn has been saying in her weather forecast. Now, just taking a look at Orlando Place, most people are back in their driveways. We've seen some people unload, unpack their cars, bring their pets back into their homes, and are certainly thankful tonight that this wasn't a much worse situation. Debbie? Indeed, Ariana, too close for sure. Hopefully the worst of it is over now. Thanks to you, Ariana Kelland, and the rest of the Here and Now crew for uh, bringing us the very latest on this. Up next, the dramatic rescue of the young soccer players trapped in a cave in Thailand. We'll walk you through the challenging rescue. Welcome back, and that theme music means we're going to meet our young athletes of the day. This is Amy Baird. She is eight years old from Kippens. Amy plays in the Novice League for the Stephenville Minor Hockey Association. Congratulations, Amy. And this young athlete is seven-year-old Isla Osman from Grand Falls, Windsor. Isla loves karate and is a white belt student of Sensei Michelle Critch. Congratulations, Isla. Okay, so back to the weather and, and you've been watching this what is it, a subtropical storm? A tropical storm, Chris. Mm. Uh, yeah, so that's going to be headed our way. It's still really early right now, but uh, it looks like it will be tracking our way later in the week. So mm -hmm. I just thought we'd have uh, we'd start by having a look at where Chris is at the moment. So right now he's uh, down by the, the Virginias uh, off the coast. They're well off the coast, but uh, we are expecting it to track north uh, towards the Maritimes and to Newfoundland later in the week so we'll be keeping an eye on that once again we do have the severe uh, thunderstorm watch in effect for parts of western labrador going to be pretty active there tonight with those high winds uh, as well to recap that heat warning that's in effect for central areas tomorrow and the fog advisory that's in effect for the southern part of the avalon cooler temperatures there as well so this is the snapshot of how temperatures are shaping up for tomorrow you can see how warm 
it's going to be in central temperatures around 30 degrees. The humidex won't be that much more around 32 degrees, so it's just going to be really hot and really dry. Not too bad in the east, 24 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. Winds staying fairly strong, 28 degrees in Corner Brook. And for Labrador, that risk of thunder showers will continue throughout the day in the western area, Happy Valley, Goose Bay, and Nain. So temperatures on the cool side as well, 13 degrees, but that will change later in the week for sure. So Tuesday night, we do have some showers that will be moving through the Buren Peninsula and eastern portions of the island. Then things will cloud up a bit. You can see more showers there on Wednesday afternoon. This is what we're looking at. Uh, temperatures still on the cool side for Lab West, 15 degrees as the high for Wednesday afternoon. A bit warmer in eastern Labrador with those chance of showers. A nice day in the west, 23 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud and chance of showers for central and the east. Probably quite welcome if those showers do pan out for central areas. Still pretty hot though, 26 degrees on Wednesday. So as we get into Thursday, things clear off a bit. We're looking at a mix of sun and cloud for the entire island. Uh, there on Thursday afternoon, cloudier in the east and a little bit cooler, 18 degrees there. A lovely day for Labrador on Thursday, 26 degrees in the east with sun and cloud. So as we get into Friday, that is when we're expecting uh, Tropical Storm Chris to get nearer to the island. So Thursday night into Friday, so we are expecting those showers and then things to cloud up uh, in the east there on Saturday, but still early days. So yes, you're looking at showers as well for central Newfoundland. Temperature staying quite warm, 20, 24 degrees. Showers continuing for western Newfoundland uh, there as that tropical storm comes our way, continuing with some showers on Saturday. And <laughs> yeah, temperatures are definitely going up from 13 degrees in eastern Labrador. So a mix of sun and cloud there on Friday. So things are going to get nice and warm as Labrador heads into the weekend. 25 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud and a few showers there on Saturday for Western Labrador. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. Relief and joy in Thailand. Efforts to rescue 12 boys trapped inside a cave with their soccer coach are paying off. After more than two weeks stuck underground, eight boys have now been freed. The CBC's Briar Stewart is close to the staging area in Thailand. Uh, it's been very busy here in the staging area with ambulances going by and helicopters in the air. All of the boys are being taken to the hospital in Chiang Rai where there is an entire floor that has been set aside from them. All of the boys have to go into isolation, which is particularly difficult because they've been trapped underground for the past 16 days and they'd like to reunite with their families and that's not possible yet because they're in isolation and doctors are concerned about their health. They're doing number of tests uh, to check to see just how their, their body has suffered over the last uh, two and a half weeks. They're concerned about malnutrition, dehydration, but the four boys who were rescued first from the cave, who have been in the hospital the longest, they are said to be doing quite well, even asking for their favorite foods. Now the rescue operations have been going faster than officials had originally expected, and really that's because water levels in the cave uh, have receded and then not risen. There hasn't been the rain uh, that there could have been today and that's really helped things out because the boys have been able to walk um, a large portion of the four kilometer route out of the cave so uh, that's been a big help there is still a, a lot of diving and that's really where the big risk is the boys have to wear full face masks and be escorted by two divers during some of the uh, most risky sections but really the water levels uh, and staying low like they have have been a big help there is a, a big push to get uh, as many rescues done as possible because monsoon rains are in the forecast tomorrow and officials are really worried about conditions deteriorating. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Chiang Rai. Meanwhile, tech giant Elon Musk is diving right into his promise to help save the boys. Now, this so-called kid-sized submarine is now on its way to Thailand after being tested by the Musk's SpaceX company in Los Angeles. Musk says the vessel can be carried by two divers and it can pass through narrow gaps in the cave. Well, there is a rescue mission underway in Japan after the nation's worst flood in more than three decades. Over 100 people have been killed in landslides caused by torrential rains, and officials are searching for dozens feared trapped in the rubble. 
Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has canceled a trip to Europe and the Middle East later this week. He said more armed forces have been called in to speed up search efforts, as hot weather is expected to put more strain on the thousands cut off from power and water. The government has set up water stations in some areas and allocated more money towards the search efforts. Some beautiful colors in this viewer photo of the day. Any guesses where this could be, Debbie? Hmm. I'll give you a hint. It is in Labrador. It's in Labrador. an area we don't often see, so we I'll let you know where. We don't see it, no. like Melville, but not a beach like that up there, but I don't know. I'll have the answer <laughs> after the break. <laughs> Let's find out where the picture of the day is from. Yeah, um, I thought this was a gorgeous shot. Yeah. And this was taken, as I said, in Labrador, Mealy Mountains. You can see them there. Just stunning. It is beautiful. And I did go, I think uh, in Happy Valley Goose Bay, they have a uh, regatta in the summer. And I was on, I, I don't remember the exact name of the mm -hmm. location, but it was just like that. So I gather there's a lot of sandy areas throughout many parts of Labrador. That is a gorgeous picture. It is. Thank you very much, Emily Shepard, for sending that in. She sent it into our uh, our email address. So if you have any photos to share of your garden or of beaches <laughs> or of sunsets or of butterflies, please send them in at uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca. We'd Love to see them all. And we use them on our website as well. There's we a really nice uh, viewer uh, gallery uh, on the website. So lots of nice shots. It's in there worth too. checking out if you haven't spent a few minutes going through those pictures. Gorgeous. Mm -hmm. That's our program, an eventful night tonight. Um, yeah. Hopefully, a fairly restful night for people in Ken Mountain Terrace. Saint Happy John's ending, there. which is good mm -hmm. for, for most people. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for being with us, and uh, we'll be back here tomorrow. Good night.